My name is Dr. Sharon Pearson. I'm on the faculty at the University of Texas, El Paso, and I'm also the editor of the Journal of the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners and the nurse author and editor. The reason for doing this presentation is to help students and other professionals learn to write for publication. There are many important lessons here about professional publication and the responsibility of authors, reviewers, editors, and researchers. And we're going to cover those today in this five-part series. My experiences come from the many years I've had of being an editor. And uh, I've tried to divide this into five parts so you can watch it in, three, in five separate modules. So first, we're going to have an overview of the problem. Uh, the second module is going to discuss, we're going to discuss authorship issues. The third, we're discussing plagiarism and how to avoid it. And four, conflicts of interest and transparency in publishing will be presented. And then the fifth and last module will be on publication misconduct and dealing with retracted literature. So our overall objectives here for this first part are to define some of these terms that we're going to be using and also to share with you some resources that you can use that will help you as you, uh, as you write uh, your papers in school and then later uh, your research and get it published in uh, peer-reviewed journals. And an important concept here is that there is a, ri a ripple effect of publication misconduct, and that's one of the themes that's going to be uh, overarching in all of these presentations. So first I want to just discuss briefly some of the assumptions that we have about the conduct and dissemination of research. We basically read articles that other people have written because we believe they're true. Uh, we think that research is conducted in an ethical manner um, and that the data are reported in an unbiased fashion and that authors do not intentionally uh, plagiarize the work of others. Unfortunately, you'll see as we go along, these assumptions aren't always true. But we don't want to, uh, we, we, would, we want to uh, preserve the integrity of the scientific record. So we want our students and we want professionals to learn how to write appropriately for uh, scholarly publication. So the first discussion I wanted to have was um, the case of Dr. Uh, Pullman. And the only reason I'm talking about this is that it illustrates the ripple effect of scientific misconduct. Um, Dr. Pullman, uh, was re his research and publication record was investigated by the Office of Research Integrity and the university where he worked. And the findings were that um, he had uh, fabricated his research findings and data in published them in 10 different articles in 10 different journals. So the ripple effect uh, of all of this was that at the time of the decision of the Office of Research Integrity, Dr. Pullman's publications had, those 10 publications had accrued a total of 3,007 citations. So that means that people had been quoting Dr. Pullman and uh, citing his research and basing some of their studies on what he had done. And we have now another several thousand articles out there that are based on fabricated data. So that's the ripple that's caused by uh, uh, fabricated data and research misconduct. So let's just define a couple of those words. Um, fabrication, and this comes from the Office of Research Integrity and the U.S. Department of um, Health and Human Services. And we're going to discuss these all in a little bit greater detail as we go on. But fabrication means that you've made up the data or results and you report them. 
Falsification can just mean that you are manipulating some of the research materials so that they come out looking different. They come out with, an, uh, with a better spin on your, on your results. And plagiarism is the appropriation of another's ideas or processes, results or words without appropriate credit. And ORI in the United States requires that institutions receiving federal research funds must have policies in place and a mechanism to investigate allegations of misconduct. Now there are other kinds of misconduct, which we see on the next slide here. Um, for example, failing to report an adverse event with a patient um, to the sponsor or to the Institutional Review Board, or a breach of um, human uh, human subject confidentiality, there are, there are a number of them, they're listed here on the slide. These, these infractions are not investigated by the Office of Research Integrity, but there are other organizations within the federal government that do those investigations, for example, the Food and Drug Administration. So there are a lot of sanctions that can occur for researchers who do not follow accepted uh, protocols and maintain complete integrity of their research process. So I want to switch now to just a brief, um, uh, a brief discussion of, of writing. Um, we're talking about here, why are we writing? Um, for you as students, you're writing to fulfill course requirements. You have to demonstrate to your faculty that you have learned what you were supposed to learn. Um, if, you're work, if you're writing to publish an article, you're trying to disseminate your research findings or your thoughts to a wider audience. Sometimes we write because we want to become famous. Um, perhaps we're, we'll, one of us will write the next great American novel, who knows. Um, but we also write personal things. We write to, um, to remember our thoughts or to organize our thoughts. And not everything that we write, of course, gets published. So how do we learn to write? And this is a very brief, just uh, for purposes of discussion, this is really not uh, a, a seminar on, on the, how, how people do learn to read and write. But um, you know that as children you learn to talk, and then you learn to read, and you learn to write in school. And you learn somehow that there are rules about writing. There are rules for writing your story about your summer vacation when you were in grammar school, and there are different rules for you writing your thesis or your dissertation. And we, we learn that we have to follow the rules or we don't get a good grade on papers or our manuscripts don't get accepted into um, the publication uh, that we're, we're targeting. And if we don't follow the rules, uh, it may be because we don't actually know how to find them or we don't know what they are. So if you're a novice at writing for publication, um, there are some general um, observations that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but underneath all of this, you do have to follow some ethical principles and those are to be honest and to do no harm. And honesty is a big factor in some of the other things discussions that we're going to have as these modules unfold. So how do you locate some of these resources? Well, first of all, there are author guidelines for specific journals. And people who do not follow author guidelines when they're submitting to a journal, um, they run the risk of having their manuscript rejected. The author guidelines are normally linked to the journal itself if there's an online platform and most journals now have, do have an online platform and you will find a link on the online platform for the uh, uh, author guidelines and you should follow those guidelines to the letter and there are other guidelines that may be of use to you the International Council of Medical Journal Editors we're going to hear a lot more about that it has to do with um, ethics um, the World Association of Medical Journal Editors, they also have some good resources on their website and you'll see some references to that in future slides. There's also an International Academy of Nurse Editors. 
commonly known as inane. We, we all love that, that title. Um, and then, of course, we've already discussed the Office of Research Integrity and then something else that we're going to talk about now, the Committee on Publication Ethics. The Committee on Publication Ethics was formed in 1997 um, in the United Kingdom. Um, now has nearly 700 members from all over the world. I was just at one of their meetings in uh, December, I mean in November, and um, it was a, it's a very, it's a really good organization for helping editors deal with ethical issues that we encounter. Um, I'm going to um, spend a little bit of time on some of this COPE information because as a journal editor, these are the guidelines that I follow when I have to deal with an ethical issue with authors and reviewers. But this website is a very good resource for anyone who is teaching ethics to uh, people who are writing for, or students who are writing for publication. But the website you can see is right at the bottom of this slide. It's uh, publicationethics.org, all one word. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this COPE code of conduct for editors. Um, if you're submitting to a journal, you should expect the editor that you are dealing with will follow these ethical guidelines. Um, we are striving to meet the needs of readers and authors, and sometimes authors believe that their manuscript is exactly what readers need, and editors may not agree with that. For the most part, editors do have a good knowledge of who their audience is. Uh, we get letters from our audience if they're not pleased. So we do know what they like and what they don't like. And so sometimes it's hard to hear that your manuscript will not really fit with the audience, but the editor's doing the best job that he or she can. Um, we also strive to improve the journal and the quality of the material that we're publishing. And we are basically champions of freedom of expression. Um, that is one of the things that uh, is essential to the integrity of the scientific record, that people need to be able to tell us what they actually found and uh, not be afraid of reprisals. Um, and the final thing on this slide is that we always have to be willing to publish corrections, clarifications, retractions, and apologies when needed. And this will become evident the more we talk about some of the ethical problems that we encounter. So some more guidelines for editors. Um, this is what makes my job difficult, um, that my general duties and responsibilities, uh, in addition to managing a journal, is that uh, I have to support initiatives designed to reduce academic misconduct. For me, that meant uh, integrating the Authenticate Manuscript Plagiarism uh, Checker into our software. And uh, it was a long and painful process to get that going, and, and, but it now works quite well. But we have to be willing to make those changes to our journal policies and to our journal processes in order to make sure that we are publishing what readers want to hear and that it's also not infringing on the copyright of others. Um, we also continually have to update our journal policies and police the behaviors of reviewers and authors so that we are discouraging misconduct. Um, there are a lot of ways that we do that. COPE is one of the resources that we rely on, um, some of the meetings that we go to, that where we discuss some of these issues. Uh, they provide us with a lot of good material, background material, uh, to help us in the, in the daily work of being an editor. Um, as far as our relations with authors go, here's a partial list of some of the things that we, have to, we are supposed to be doing. In addition, we are supposed to publish clear instructions uh, about submissions and what we expect from authors. And to that extent, I have revised the author guidelines for the journals that I edit a number of times, keeping up with the changing times and um, providing authors with resources that they need, such as links to the COPE uh, website or the ICMGA 
ICMJE gu uh, guidelines. And um, finally, I have to ensure that I've got appropriate reviewers selected to review submissions and that there are no conflicts of interest among, uh, between the reviewer and the, and the potential author. So overall, it's a very um, um, demanding job to be an editor. And for the most part, we also have day jobs. Most of us are academics, uh, or some, there are some journals where there are clinicians uh, who are the editors. But it's, uh, it takes a long time for manuscripts to be processed, and I know that authors are impatient. When they submit something, they want to see their article in print as quickly as possible. Um, we do we do want to get things published as quickly as possible also because our goal is always to get the latest information out to our readers. But there are things that we do need to be sure that we have covered, such as checking for plagiarism, making sure that the, everything is scientifically correct, and copy editing, and laying out, and linking all of the references so that people can use the articles that we uh, publish for the benefit of their own research and their own education. So to summarize this first overview that we're talking about in, in publication ethics, uh, we have a responsibility to maintain the integrity of the scientific record, and that falls to everyone, to editors, to authors, to reviewers, and also to those who conduct research and those who sponsor research. Uh, as authors, reviewers, researchers, and editors, we are obligated to report scientific misconduct. As educators, we're obligated to teach ethical conduct in regard to research and writing. And we should all remember that resources to assist with these obligations are freely available on the internet. And I'll show you a number of those things as we progress and into the next modules.